Next is a Herculean task because um, if you're going to talk on spec CT in orthopedics, it is a one-day course. Each uh, joint of the human body takes at least half an hour to explain, to convince, and to do uh, good practice. But I will try my best for the next 40 minutes, try to uh, take you into the role of spec CT in benign uh, orthopedic conditions. Mostly I will concentrate on pre-operative scenario because post-operative scenario is more challenging. And uh, basically what we do at uh, Guys and St. Thomas is, is if the patient has got an acute symptoms, they go for a plain x-ray, then for an MRI. If it's a fracture, they go for a CT. And if it's a tendon pathology, musculoskeletal, they go for an ultrasound. But the main role of uh, uh, hybrid imaging comes in chronic symptoms. That's quite challenging. And often they go with an MR. If MR is positive and then they're looking in terms of any bony pathology, they go for a CT. But if MR is equivocal, most of the cases, then we will have a spec CT. If the spec CT is normal, then the patient gets discharged. The beauty of this practice is it's quite easy for us to say all these things because uh, we work closely with the musculoskeletal radiologist. So when he gets a referral for an MRI, he decides whether MR will be useful in that particular scenario or whether he wants to go for a spec CT first. And secondly, uh, Hybrid imaging in benign pathology is challenging. You cannot do anything on your own. Even if you have a radiologist, you're not going to get 100% of the answer. So you need a combination of a nuclear medicine physician, a musculoskeletal radiologist, and more useful, you have to have a good rapport with your orthopedician. Because whatever you say, he has to believe. And the feedback helps you to learn, because we are in the learning curve. So what I'm going to do is, most of the scans which I'm going to show, I want you to just think what you would have reported by just looking at the bone scan, whether it's a two-phase or a whole body, and how I'm going to bring in new uh, terminologies and jargons, and that will help you to think how much, because as a general nuclear medicine physician, any uptake in benign, my first instance will be degenerative disease. I can't think anything beyond that. But with spec CT, with working with a musculoskeletal radiologist, you learn uh, quite a lot of things, and it's quite challenging, especially if you're working with elite uh, sports people, the diagnosis plays an important role. So close collaboration with a radiologist with musculoskeletal background and an orthopedician is vital if you want to do high quality orthopedic practice within your department. And people say uh, the, the conventional nuclear medicine imaging is changing and more and more people are into PET CT. I love PET CT. PET CT is important in terms of oncology. But if you do good onco I mean, uh, benign orthopedic you can definitely do about 15 to 20 patients a day. You can do equal number of scans compared to a PET CT. It depend All you need is one good orthopedician who believes in you, and then you can change the whole scenario of your department doing spec CT image. So coming to ultrasound in benign pathology, it's a dynamic imaging modality. You can get multiple planes. It's widely available, low cost. You can portable. You can take into any uh, room in your hospital. No ionizing radiation operator dependent and also if you're going to look at carefully about the bone pathology it may not be that great and if you're looking into deeper tissues ultrasound may not be that great so but it is one of most uh, useful investigation in musculoskeletal especially to looking for uh, soft tissue pathology or tendinosis or enthesiopathies and other things what does ct do in musculoskeletal pathology you can look at the structure you can look at the fractures you can look at the position of the fracture extent of the fracture number of fragments dimension of destruction, all this information is important for an orthopod. If you just say there is a fracture, increased uptake, fine. What does bone scan add to my diagnosis, my management? I don't think so. He's going to ask for it. MR will show marrow changes. It will show vascular changes, signal intensity, structural integrity, and infiltration. And of course, our bone imaging will look in terms of vascularity, increased metabolic activity, and it's always based on the intensity of uptake and also the pattern of uptake. So all these three modalities, four modalities in together have to be taken in conjunction. If you want to do good orthopedic practice, you need to understand and appreciate the advantages of limitations of each technique. Otherwise, it is going to be challenging. Spectrum, different departments do differently. Some people do conventional whole body bone scan with or without static imaging. Some may do localized SPECT. Some may do localized SPECT CT. Some may do diagnostic SPECT CT. So first of all, when you're doing CT, you, you need to ask three questions to yourself. Why you're doing CT? Either for attenuation correction, or you're doing it for uh, just localization, 
or you're doing it for a definitive diagnosis or characterization. Most of the oncological practice you can get away with uh, less than three or four slices, but if you want to do high quality orthopedic, you need to have multi-slice. You need multi-slice because you need to have 3D recon, 3D reconstruction, and that's what helps the surgeon to plan his surgery. So if you want to do high quality orthopedic practice, you should have four plus slices to give a high quality orthopedic service. You need to take good and careful history, most important, because most of the diagnosis is in the history. Often we don't uh, use it, but if you're not convinced with the report, go back to the history. Dynamic and blood pool images will stay, and it is most important. It is just like sentinel node imaging, though they say spec CT is going to change, but still dynamic imaging will play a major role. The spec CT will be an additional component to the planar imaging, especially in the sentinel node. In similar aspect, the two-phase bone scan will stay in orthopedic practice. Positioning of the patient is important because any movement will cause artifacts and positional and therefore localization may be a problem. Coming to wrist and hand, why wrist and hand? Spec CT is useful here because you have too many bones in your hand. You've got 27 bones and accurate localization, just a focal uptake on a bone scan, it is very difficult to convincingly say which of the carpal bones is involved. So if it's on the either side, you can take a guess, but if it's in the mid portion, it's quite challenging and there are multiple joints so if you want to give a definitive answer, you need accurate localization. And also you need to understand the blood supply. It's quite unusual because frequently the most of the blood supply is in the distal part. So if there is any proximal injury, there is more potential for avascular necrosis. Coming to fractures of carpal bones, nearly uh, 68 to 70 percent of the fractures of the carpal bones are scaphoid, followed by other bones. And carpal fractures account for nearly 20 percent of hand fractures and wrist fractures, and in total fractures in the whole body, 6% of all fractures. And 30% of the fractures will be missed on a conventional x-ray uh, in an early part. But if the proximal portion of the fraction disruption, you get about 50% of the chances for scaphoid fracture, avascular necrosis. I'm not going to just show uh, the images and the diagnosis. I'm also going to give some amount of literature, the new terminologies, new jargons, just to understand how complex it is, and we have to go back to the books. That's what we do. Every day, we have to read certain things, which is new to nuclear medicine physicians, because a CD was not a part of our curriculum, and the terminologies, even for a conventional radiologist, is quite challenging. What are the spectrum of findings in orthopedic indications? It's not only related to risk. You can see hyperemia, you can you'll see erosions, you can see osteoporosis, synovitis, you will see effusion, cortical cyst, joint space narrowing, and also you can say changes in marrow. What is the evidence? Evidence is we looked at uh, about 44 patients. Bone scan in terms of localization, you can localize with the two-phase bone scan 60% with spec CT 100%. Overall bone scan detected most of the lesions. When there is an uptake, you know there is something wrong there. But in terms of lesion characterization, spec CT as an edge. If you do a conventional two-phase bone scan, your lesion characterization is approximately 40-45%, but by doing spec CT, you get diagnosis in approximately 95% of the patients, definitive diagnosis. Another paper by looking at 51 patients, persisting wrist pain, and spec CT results were compared with X-ray or X-ray combined with planar bone scan, and 48 lesions were detected on plain radiographs, 117 on planar bone scans, 142 on spec CT. And in fact, 60% of the positive concordance between the clinical diagnosis and the spec CT. The reason we need to get a proper diagnosis in orthopedics because if you don't get a proper diagnosis, the patient is going to get multiple scans. And secondly, every time he visits an orthopedist in the clinic, again, he has to start the whole cycle of imaging to get a definitive answer. So spec CT classified correctly 85% of indeterminate lesions, and it improved the specificity as well as the diagnostic accuracy. This is a patient, presents with long-term wrist pain, an unremarkable wrist x-ray. Your uh, early blood pool images is not uh, that great, it's unremarkable, whereas on the delayed uh, spect images, there is a focal area of increased uptake. On, on the CT, there is a cystic lesion, increased uptake, and the diagnosis was a lunate enchondroma. So what is lunate enchondroma? It's a benign tumor, and it's uh, quite uncommon in carpal bones and it's generally asymptomatic. When it becomes symptomatic, then they have to intervene. The treatment will be a complete curatage and reconstruction, 
And in this case, PECCT was useful to exclude avascular necrosis because most of the indications, they will ask you whether there is an infection or avascular necrosis. In the past, every time there is increased vascularity, every time there is increased uptake, we will always think possibly infection, we will go for a white cell scan. But with the advent of PECCT, I think in our department, nearly 50% of the white cell scans have reduced. So we get a definitive answer just by PECCT. Another patient, fracture of right scaphoid waist. As you can see, there is an increased uptake, and there is also not complete fusion. There is non-union, common if it involves the waist of the scaphoid. And there are three types of displacement. It could be uh, displaced, non-displaced, or proximal uh, pole fractures. Proximal pole fractures are the most commonest and challenging because the, most of the complications of non-union, avascular necrosis, and arthritis are more towards proximal because the blood supply is more towards the distal. Once there is a break in blood supply in the distal, the proximal gets affected more commonly. Patient fell several months prior to imaging, complete pain, focal uptake on a bone scan. I can say there is increased uptake, fracture. Next question is which bone and whether it's union or non-union or often what happens is, in this case, it was a non-union and also by adding a bone scan to patients with fall, you pick up additional 12% of non, uh, uh, I mean, uh, non-scaphoid fractures. And also one third of mid-scaphoid fractures demonstrate delayed union. And SPECCT is useful to establish metabolic and morphological changes. So you give a definitive diagnosis, and these sorts of images is what an orthopedician wants to see, and that helps his plan and management. As long as it helps him, the technology is fantastic. If it's not helping him, then the technology is just like any other imaging modality. This patient presents with a non-traumatic uh, pain, a right hand. Again, you have a focal uptake. I would have said possibly fracture. But in this case, you're looking at some um, an extra bone in that area. So that we made a diagnosis as an accessory ossicle. In fact, it's quite common. And it is challenging only when it becomes uh, symptomatic. If it is asymptomatic, we see most often in the patients, we don't worry too much. But if it is uh, symptomatic, either the patient has to be surgical resection. Most often they'll have a surgical resection because often uh, temporarily with uh, pain relief management, they often uh, feel better. But over a long-term period, surgical excision will be the treatment in these patients. So in wrist imaging, spec CT is useful. It's definitely useful. And wrist imaging is one of the most complicated areas in orthopedic because whatever you do, there is an additional uh, degenerative changes. Accurate localization is most important. Spexity and spine, the challenging aspect is low back pain. Low back pain is one of the commonest in any health budget. Most of the money is spent looking at patients with low back pain. And most of the sickness from the workplaces is commonly due to low back pain. Any country you take, everybody at some stage in your life will have low back pain. Depends on whether you sit in the front rows or the back row. The back row will have more back pain depending on the seatings. So it increases as you grow older, the pain increases. And in fact, it's often challenging to make a specific diagnosis and a specific management. And you can classify them as radicular pain and non-radicular. So what's the role of, what are the common causes? Before we go, what is the role of uh, spec CT in this group of patients? Causes could be multiple. In fact, it is more than this, but generally it could be a fracture, it could be malignancy, it could be visceral. It could be psychological stress can also cause back pain. You know, it's amazing, you know, the, all these things, deformity, infection, neurological, all these problems. Back pain is very nonspecific and anybody can get back pain. And what is the role of spec CT here? In this sense, whole body scan uh, will miss most of the facet joint disease, but spec used to pick up most of the uh, facet joint disease. But the problem is accurate localization. You need to give accurate localization for the orthopod or a radiologist to do an injection. Because even general, even if you miss one level, it's okay because you often inject one level above and below the cytofocal uptake. But spec CT will help in terms of accurate localization in these patients. Because if you do just CT, CT will show uh, degenerative changes, but nearly 50% of the degenerative changes will not be metabolically active. So what you see on a CT is not real. And if, you, if the clinical question is whether, which is the pain generator, a nuclear medicine scan is the only uh, scan which will tell a potential pain generator as a cause of uh, pain in that particular patient. Facet joint disease, again, it could be unilateral, multilateral, uh, can be bilateral, single level, multiple level. And if you do expect 
uh, CT routinely, you get a patterns like this. There is an increased uptake in the spine. You have to be precise, whether it's costa vertebral or costa transverse, it's an osteophyte or a bone island or a facet joint disease. By adding CT to your SPECT scan, we are more confident and we give you a definitive answer. And also, it's challenging in patients with a scan like this. You will have a whole body bone scan, linear uptake, vertebral fracture, forget it. You don't have to think too much about it. But the patient will go, they'll get treated for the vertebral fracture, but still there'll be persistent pain. So when the patient has got persistent pain, always in a patient with vertebral fracture, you should always think of additional facet joint injury. Whenever there is a vertebral fracture, there will be some injury to the facet joint also. So the patient may be treated for the vertebral fracture, persistent pain, you should always think of facet joint disease. You'll always do a SPECT CT or a SPECT in patients with vertebral collapse because you often pick up additional facet joint disease and they have to be treated for both facet joint disease as well as the vertebral collapse. SPECT CT, pelvis and hips. This is a patient, degenerative changes in the right hip, sacral leg joint and uh, pubic symphysis. The question is whether there is increased uptake in the right proximal femur. In this case, there is increased uptake. So what is the diagnosis? Then you go into a differential. It could be benign. It could be malignant. But with the spec CT, it's a cystic lesion. And what is more interesting is often we forget to, we always think there is increased uptake in this area. We think it's a bladder and forget it. But in this case, there is a specific increased uptake at the pubic symphysis. It's a very common finding in sports people, people who cycle, people who do horse riding, People postpartum, the commonest cause of pelvic pain postpartum is osteitis pubis. Most of the uh, patients post delivery, they'll have persistent pain in the perineum, persistent pain in the pelvis. That's often due to osteitis pubis, which is quite common. And in this case, we made a diagnosis, multiple diagnoses. In fact, it was an enchondroma, and the other one was osteitis pubis. So you make a definitive diagnosis. And whenever you see a cortical lesion, you have to look for the zone of transition, presence of absence of periostitis, pattern of bone destruction, age of the patient, symptoms, and you always have to spend more time looking at the images to get a definitive diagnosis. Another patient, low back pain and hip pain. Patchy uptake, I mean, it's clear cut. I can say it's facet joint disease, some degenerative disease in the spine. But if you look carefully at the burn scan, there is some uptake in the iliac bone. You gotta say, possibly degenerative and forget it. But with SPEC CT, we made three diagnoses in this. On the SPEC bit, facet joint disease confirmed. And you can see there is increased uptake here, which corresponds to an avulsion injury. And also there is a sclerotic lesion here, and that was a bone island, which is not positive on the MDP bone scan. So you pick up additional findings and a definitive diagnosis. Why it is important? Because avulsion of rectus femoris is a common portion, although it's a less common injury. It occurs in patients with kicking sports like uh, soccer and rugby, and often we miss this if you're doing a conventional bone scan. Any uptake, we say it's non-specific and uh, clinical or radiological correlation, and that's what my report will say without spec CT in these patients. Patients again with bilateral uh, THR and left uh, TKR. Patient has persistent pain in the hip. In this case, there is a focal uptake here because even the clinical question they ask you is whether there is infection or loosening. But the way orthopedics is changing is if you are looking in terms of your white cell scan and your bone scan, 50% of your reports are always wrong if you're talking in terms of infection or loosening. And in fact, the newer guidelines in the European sector, there is no role for any imaging in patients with knee pain post-arthroplasty, they say if you're thinking of an infection, puncture, do a cytology, and that is the definitive diagnosis, and that's why it is becoming complicated for us because we have completed our uh, EANM bone guidelines. The clinical question is how much to give stress to uh, the role of bone scan and white cell imaging in patients with processes. Whenever you are reporting processes, it's not only infection or loosening. You have to think two additional components. You need to think of biomechanical component and a biochemical component. Unless you understand what type of processes is put, how it is put, you're not going to get your answers right. Even because if you talk to an orthopod, if you say there is an increased uptake in the medial compartment, I think it's loosening, the orthopodician will say, I think it's a normal finding because I know that with the particular processes, the patient is going to wait bear on the medial component, not on the lateral component. But without that 
discussion without that learning curve, you will always get your reports. Most of the centers globally, we, especially uh, imaging processes is quite challenging and you have never got it more than 50% right, whatever technology you use. But there is one group uh, looking at uh, these things. They have a software package looking at the biomechanical component and also the biochemical component. And uh, that is the only group which has published quite a lot on processes. It's a group in uh, Basel. There's an orthopedic surgeon who is very interested in spec CT. Uh, so he's, in fact, written a book which is 1,400 pages only related to knee processes. So he must be a very uh, fascinating surgeon. In this case, there is a focal uptake here. That turned out to be a fracture. Fracture post uh, prosthesis is quite common. And in fact, uh, periprosthetic fractures, usually up to 1% to 4%, and most of the 5% of them is greater trochanter. And if you do a revision surgery, the chances of fractures increases. And usually they don't do anything unless uh, the patient is very symptomatic, uh, usually with painkillers and a little bit of physio, and a change in their walking style and patterns, uh, most of them uh, have some benefit. This is another patient, fracture, neck of femur, still stiff lumbar pain. And in this case, the bone scan looks unremarkable. There's nothing much happening there. But if you do on the SPECT scan, there is uh, increased area of uptake. There is fusion, osteophytic lesion fusing there. And that is the pain generator in this patient. So sacroiliac joint pain uh, is a primary pain generator. And it's useful if you give a definitive diagnosis because uh, whenever there is, it's not, if there is a pain in the sacrum, it's not always sacroiliitis. It could be other pathologies. So we have to be concerned about uh, what is happening in this particular patients. Patients with low back pain and anything abnormal in this scan? What's that? This bit? That's fine. Otherwise? patient complains of hip pain. But if you look carefully, when you do more and more spec CT, there is some uptake here, right? That is degenerative, I would have said. Forget it. But combination, if you do the spec CT technology, we pick up certain things. Although MR is a very useful modality, it goes to a common cause, it's called femoral acetabular impeachment. It is one of the commonest cause for idiopathic osteoarthritis in the patient. So if you don't detect early, if you don't treat them, they're going to go for a hip replacement at some stage. There are two types. In fact, CAM type and a pincer type. And the commonest will be the mixed type. There'll be a combination of uh, the CAM type and the pincer type. It depends. The CAM type is the femoral head. If it is not spherical, then it will not going to stick in the socket. It's going to impinge on the acetabulum, causing repeated pain. But if you do just a whole body bone scan, even aspect, we would have just pushed it as degenerative disease. Although MR is a gold standard in this patients to pick up all these uh, subtle changes. Pincer type, the astablum has too much coverage, and therefore patient may get into a problem. And, and if you don't detect them early, especially it's common in sports individuals and young patients, if a patient with 30 and 40 years complains of hip pain, and you know, it's unlikely to be arthritis or rheumatoid factors, you have to think of any additional enthesiopathy or any impingement syndromes in this group of patients. Coming to spec CT in orthopedics, we'll go to knees. And this is a retrospective study. We, we analyzed 39 patients. And what is interesting is add significant incremental value to bone scan and spec, improves detection, localization, and characterization, improves diagnostic accuracy. And what is more important, we found, was if it is degenerative, the role of a spec CT is not that great. But if it is non-arthropathic indications, and that's where spec CT picks in, and it gives definitive diagnosis in most of the scenarios. This is a patient with persistent knee pain. I wouldn't have called anything. We see this in every patient. Knee pain, there's uptake in the patella. And I see in every bone scan patient. So should I call it? Should I not call it? We called it. We did spec CT because of the initial stages. And if you could see, the patella is not in the groove. It is maltracking towards the lateral aspect and it's bilateral maltracking. Conventionally, it has to be in the groove, and if it is not in the groove, it will impinge towards the lateral aspect or the medial aspect, persistent pain, and it is one of the commonest causes. Again, MR is useful. Dynamic MR they do in these type of patients, but 
additional role of spec CT we are picking up, there is a potential indication for patients with patellar maltracking or patellar pain. And even in patients with post-knee uh, prostheses, when they say there is got a pain in the knee, the most commonest cause of pain in a post-knee replacement patient is patellofemoral arthritis. It's not loosening, it's not infection. Most of the time, it's patellofemoral arthritis. And if it's a diffuse uptake on the patella, don't worry about it. But if it's a focal uptake, that's where the patient may benefit from resurfacing. So you need to tell whether the uptake is focal or uptake is diffuse, and that helps in patient management. Left knee pain, bone scan shows increased vascularity, increased metabolic activity. Then you get into the differential modes. I would have said increased metabolic activity fits in patient's clinical symptoms. If he's got trauma, I would say fracture. If they say suspicious of a bone tumor, I'll say possible bone tumor. So whatever the clinical history, I'll be guided by that. But in this case, doing the CT, there is something like that, which if I don't know musculoskeletal neurology, I said that could be a fracture, but that's not a fracture because it's got a good cortical margin and that turned out to be what is called as a bipartite patella, which is a normal variant. It's an accessory ossification. It's an incidental finding, and it's often asymptomatic. And if it becomes symptomatic, we have to excise it. That's the only thing. But it is often commonly mistaken for a fracture, so bipartite patella. Another patient, renal transplant. He's got two renal transplants, two kidneys sitting in the pelvis, persistent pain in the knee. And it's, again, non-specific focal uptake. We could have said could be... Possibly, if you would have been slightly clever, if they're on steroids, you would have said suspicious for avascular necrosis, but I'm not sure, but I'll sus I'm suspecting avascular necrosis. But in this case, the patient had bilateral avascular necrosis, and the right side was more symptomatic, so he went on to have a knee replacement in this case. Again, avascular necrosis, it's a second common site, is the knee. It could be a spontaneous osteonecrosis, or it could be a secondary osteonecrosis. Another patient with a conventional two-phase bone scan uptake. Again, it's non-specific, and I, I, I don't, I'll not worry too much about it. There is some uptake, possibly degenerative, possibly it could be uh, the patella, it could be anything. But with spec CT, you can see the uptake is at the top of the patella. Whenever there is an injury to the patella, often you will have quadriceps tendinosis. There will be overuse of the structure. Pain develops gradually, but without spec CT, we would have said just degenerative and would have passed. But with additional imaging, good history, we come to a definitive diagnosis. And this is the slide. If you do a knee scan, for a two-phase bone scan of the knees, all you see is increased uptake, increased vascularity. But you add the CT to your spec, then you get four different diagnoses. But without the additional CT component, my only diagnosis would have been either it's nonspecific or it could be fracture or safest is degenerative disease. That's everything, everything, any uptake in benign is degenerative, but with spec CT, I get a definitive diagnosis. Four different diagnoses, specific diagnosis rather than one non-specific diagnosis. The last bit is foot and ankle, ankle pathologies, the varieties, you can talk about osseous, tendinosis, varsal, but not to worry, all the slides will be there for you. When you have time, you can look at it more in detail. I don't want to bore you and put you to sleep. And indications, there are ample indications. If you want to start spec CT in your hospital, first go for the foot. It's the most convincing and most rewarding. And that's where your MR will fail in most of the conditions because most of these patients will have uh, knee, uh, nails and prostheses and post-operative fusions. So that's where spec CT as an additional edge in this group of patients. What is in the literature, in fact, 78% of the findings of the spec CT was discordant with the initial clinical diagnosis. So nearly 80% what was suspected clinically turned out to be different using spec CT technology. Therefore, it changes the management, changes the diagnosis just by using spec CT technology. Positioning, I'm not going into detail because, I, I, as I said, it's a quite a huge uh, area. Spec CT, uh, you can go on talking for a whole day. But this is what we do, the patient positioning. In fact, positioning the patient itself should be a separate talk. Then I can go through in detail in terms of reconstruction and all those aspects. But as of now, this is a patient with 36, 39-year-old patient, previous subtellar fusion. The clinical question was whether there was uh, fusion or uh, non-fusion or what is happening in this particular patient. And if you could see the CT component, there is relatively good fusion, and that is the screw channel. 
it's quite intact. And the uptake somewhere here is at the tip of the screw channel. If you use the image, you're seeing at the tip of the screw channel, which could be just degenerative changes, and the further degenerative changes here. So you're making a definitive diagnosis. It is not non-union or non-fusion. It is just degenerative disease. And that could be just a pain generator, and often they get a local steroid injections, and they become uh, all right. Another patient, 47-year-old patient, just imagine, this is the bone scan, and the clinical question is whether there is uh, fusion or non-fusion or infection. Because in this scenario, if you do a two-phase bone scan, it is going to be active. It's going to show increased metabolic activity, increased vascularity, so you will ask for a white cell scan. But if you have a spec CT, you pick up multiple pathology. There is a nail, at the tip of the nail, there is increased uptake, and again, there is non-union of the subtellar fusion. And also further, there is increased uptake in this area. So you have three diagnoses in one scan rather than just a one non-specific diagnosis. In this case, there is anthesiopathy or ostrigon. And the cause of the pain most likely because it is protruding, and that is likely to be the pain generator. And that non-union they uh, knew before. So non-union rates, 16%. And how do you classify? You need to know when to call non-union when to call degenerative disease, whether it's partial union or complete union. So there are CT arbitrary values, which you can look at it. But spec CT, from one diagnosis of just non-union, you give three diagnoses. It helps in terms of pain management, because you have treated one condition, the patient is still complaining of pain, then you know that that is not the pain generator, there is an alternative pain generator in this group of patients. This is another interesting case. Patient came with bony lesion, and they thought it was a mitotic lesion could be a non-ossifying fibroma. Fine, agreed. There is no uptake there, sclerotic lesion, but you picked up all additional lesions. The patient's got multiple osteochondral defects and has also got an osteophyte. So in this case, the pain generator was not the non-ossifying fibroma. It was the osteochondral defects and the osteophytic changes he had in the front of the talus. So non-ossifying fibroma is generally negative on a bone scan, so the role of bone scan is minimal. Increased uptake if it's the healing phase, and intense uptake, you need to have an alternative diagnosis. The tracer becomes intense. Whenever in a benign pathology there is an increased uptake, you always suspect fracture in these scenarios. Taylor Doom osteochondral defect was a clinical scenario, but in this case you can see the bones doesn't look right. If you look at it, it's fused in a different direction and a tarsal collision. This is one of the main indications where you can see, because on the CT, you will diagnose tarsal collision. In fact, a good x-ray will help you to diagnose tarsal collision, but most often in bone scan, we see uptake opposite to the collision. Because the thing is, if the patient is changing the biomechanical stress, is altering the stress towards the other aspect, there'll be metabolic uptake on the normal part of the bone rather than the tarsal collision bit, and therefore, Spec CT really helps to assess where is the pain generator in this group of patients. I'll skip this. Coming to sports injuries, which is the last bit. Elite sports injuries is quite challenging because it's not just an orthopedician. You need to have a coach. They have a trainer. They have a business manager. They have a sporting club. They have a physiotherapist and a legal representatives. And often when you have the scan, you get multiple phone calls from VIPs thinking, you know, what's happened to this particular patient. Spexity plays an important role, but before that, how does the bone respond to bone stress? As the stress increases, you get progressive deformity, and after it goes beyond an elastic range, then the stress terminates, then it's okay, then it comes back to normal, but if it's stress is repeated stress, the elastic range is exceeded, then the plastic deformity or microfracture steps in. When there is microfractures, repeated stress to microfractures, there'll be cracks. When there is cracks, there'll be a cortical fracture. So it goes by the law of elasticity. Anybody will stretch as long as it can stretch, but if it tries to stretch beyond what it can stretch, it will not stretch, it will break. So it's a simple philosophy. The bone mechanism goes in. And again, the repair of the bone. This is a patient with a tibial stress fracture in a runner. And the clinical question was, patient's got a stress fracture. It's straightforward with a two-phase bone scan you would have diagnosed it. And in fact, tibia is a, one of the commonest causes of stress fractures, followed by metatarsals and fibula. And if you're a professional athlete, stress fractures is common in tibia. If you're a non-professional, if you're a recreational, the problem is more in the pelvis because you, you don't use the right technique so you can fall and you can injure the pelvis, not the main bone.
This is an interesting scan. This patient had a distal fibular pain and they want to confirm whether the patient's got a stress fracture. In this case, if we would have said it's a stress fracture, it's a right diagnosis, the patient would have had management, but still the patient would have got persistent pain. The reason is the patient has got a stress fracture, but he's also got another stress fracture in this area, and he's also got a posterior impeachment which is our strigonum defect. So even if they would have treated for the stress fracture, the patient would have had persistent pain. All this patient needs is change in his exercise uh, regime and change in his style of running. All these important factors we can give. If you do just do a two-phase bone scan, you would have said stress fracture and you would have said that could be degenerative disease or this could be a possible additional stress fracture. But we picked up the additional finding which is a most important finding if an orthopedician or a strainer has to recommend his training pattern. Coming to, this is quite common in anger sports individual, bilateral pass defect. So it involves a connecting bone. It has to be treated early. If you don't treat it early, they'll have persistent pain lifelong. You can't do much to these patients if there is a fracture. So spec CT helps in picking up this early because the CT helps in making a definitive diagnosis. Painful heel, it's a straightforward diagnosis again. You can say it's plantar fasciitis. Most often we are right, but often we pick up some additional findings in the other areas, like bursitis and other things we can pick up with your spec CT technology. And plantar fasciitis is the commonest cause of pain in a heel pain. It could be multifactorial, it could be biomechanical dysfunction or overuse. MR is the main standard, but again, if you're just seeing it on the bone scan, always do a spec CT because you'll pick up additional uh, tendinosis like Achilles tendon insertion in these patients because often you will not have only a plantar fasciitis. If a patient is an athlete, he'll have a combination of fasciitis as well as uh, insertional tendinitis. I'll skip fast because I know it's uh, too much. One and a half hour, it's like a uh, Hollywood movie. At least uh, the gravity had two actors in this year. I'm just all alone standing here for one and a half hours. So this is a common finding with MRI. You pick up something like this, it could be straightforward degenerative, but you need to understand there is something called as an impingement syndromes. Any focal uptake at the joint space, it's not just degenerative, you'll pick up additional pathology. And in, there are not just impingement syndromes, there are about six types. You need to know whether it's an anterior impingement, postural lateral, anteromedial, anterolateral, posterior, and each type of sports uh, things you pick up or each type of uh, dance, whether you're doing ballet dancing or tap dancing and all sorts of things, each can cause a different types of impingement syndrome. And this is, depends on whether you play soccer, you play kickboxing, you're dancing, you're a gymnast, multiple pathologies. And these initial pickups helps them to change their pattern of dancing or pattern of uh, their exercise, therefore prevents long-term complications. So by doing spec CT, you're picking up early changes rather than cortical changes which appear quite late at the stage. Management in these patients, impingement is physiotherapy. Most often you pick up early, they change your exercise pattern and the regime. But if you wait for too much, they have to do surgical resection. Once you have a resection, then your insurance goes up and you are no longer wanted in any team. Coming to the last bit, frequently asked questions. Radiation issue. In fact, in orthopedic, most of them we do a diagnostic scans, 1.5 millimeter slice thickness, and the radiation patient gets us towards the periphery, and it's always less than one millisievert. So radiation is not a big issue in orthopedics, even if you do a diagnostic scan. But again, I'm saying individual departments has to categorize whether you want to do a scan for attenuation correction, localization, or a definitive diagnosis. Why spec CT? This is a clinical scenario. You have a bone scan. If it's diagnostic, fantastic. They get a treatment. If it's indeterminate, that's when the problem starts. You have further radiological examination. Then often the clinician sees the report on the day of his next appointment. Then he reads the report and he says, patient needs a CT. Then he asks for a CT. It takes another two weeks. And then the whole pathway gets delayed for at least four to six weeks. But doing spec CT, you have a one-stop imaging. At least you can give definitive diagnosis to an orthopod. Efficient workflow, it plays an important role. It's not straightforward as oncological imaging because the orthopod relies on you. If you're not giving him a good answer, he's going to stick to an MR. MR is easy because they give a descriptive report. So you get a differentials, you get a descriptive report, and most of the orthopedicians 
understand MRI report more than a spec CT report because spec CT is an evolutionary mode. You need to have adequate clinical information. Always look at the previous imaging. That's the standard teaching at RSNA. You have to look at all the images before you start uh, reporting the scan or during at least in the process. You need to look at the previous imaging, whether it's a nuclear medicine or non-nuclear medicine imaging. You have to optimize protocol injected activity and speak to the orthopedician whenever you are in doubt or talk to a clinician. It often helps. You have to have a standardized protocol. You need to have good reconstruction. And in our department, all orthopedic indications will have a spec CT directly uh, referred. So all patients with orthopedic benign indications will have a spec CT. Reporting, you need to have a good report. All you need is a 3D recon. 3D recon helps the orthopedician in planning a surgery. And they also understand better. If they don't understand their report, they understand the 3D recon better. And they know exactly what to do, whether to wait or go for further imaging or do surgery. Good communication, again, is the same thing. But musculoskeletal is challenging. As I said, still, we are in the learning process. And you cannot diagnose what you don't know. So you have to get into this. There's quite a lot of information in Radiopedia, which is a very good website, I think, so for musculoskeletal, you need to understand the pathologies. And you need a team effort, a dedicated team, and a good protocols. There is a continuous learning curve. Nobody gets it right uh, every time. You still, in spite of using MRI, in spite of using CT, in spite of using bone scan, still you may not get a definitive diagnosis. Coming to reporting, the style is we look at the bone scan first. We talk about the vascularity, uptake, and intensity. We describe the bone scan. And then we go to a CT, you have to be systematic. You have to look at the joint space. You have to look at the alignment. You look at the bone density. You look at the soft tissue, tendon insertion, relationship with the other structures around the bone, and neurovascular bundles. You need to have a structured report. You can be descriptive in your uh, description pattern, but in the interpretation, you have to be definitive. You can't sit on the fence. You have to give definitive answer, or at least one or two differentials but not a vague answer like increased metabolic activity, increased vascularity is not the answer. This is a challenge. This is to convince that spec CT is spectacular. This is a patient with sickle cell disease, increased uptake in the ribs. The question is rib fracture, rib infarction. How many go for rib fracture in this? Patient with sickle cell disease, pain in the ribs, not rib fracture. Very good. Rib infarction. Probably infection, non-specific, any other diagnosis? Can I? Okay, so we did spec CT, and that was nothing but a calcified spleen. It's not in the rib. But people often tell me, oh, you could have done a lateral, you would have picked it up. Yes, I will do a lateral. I will say it is suspicious, but I can't be definitive. So again, by doing spec CT, it was a calcified spleen, not a rib, not anything else. Another patient, amputation, infection, left below knee stump. There is increased vascularity, increased uptake. The clinical question was whether the patient has got osteomyelitis. I would have said osteomyelitis. Even with the first year residency, you will say suspicious for osteomyelitis. And how many will call it as infection? Osteomyelitis, how many will go for osteomyelitis? How many will proceed for a white cell scan? How many will ask for a marrow scan? How many will go for MRI? How many will go for spec CT? I would say start with spec CT, and all this turned out to be heterotopic ossification. It's not osteomyelitis. It is not osteomyelitis. So it was a significant change. We would have said white cell, all these things, and then we would have made a definitive impact. Sometimes you need to, uh, it's quite challenging. Whatever you do, you don't understand. In this patient, pain, both wrist and hands, increased metabolic activity. Why it's looking like that? I, know, I, I can't understand. Then my musculoskeletal guy said, it's not, we took in history. Then we looked at the patient examination. And then it all makes sense. The scan was like this. There is a fusion. It's a congenital anomaly fused of all the digits. And all they were asking was whether there is increased metabolic activity to assess any degenerative disease. So sometimes 
whatever you do, you may not, uh, you need to have a careful history. That's what uh, in the end it means. So bone specificity, what does it add? Um, it helps in localization, as I said, characterization, specificity, definitive diagnosis, reduction of equivocal reports, and that's what is most important to me, and increases my confidence, and ultimately spec CT is spectacular. Do you believe it? How many? 98, okay, uh, two are missing. Spec CT is spectacular, there's no doubt about it. And if you want further reading, if you're going to start a system, there's a muscular skeletal CT protocols, excellent by uh, a department in the US, and it's fantastic. If you want to start, just follow them, you'll be right most of the times. If you want to know more about bone, there is uh, a bone update in seminars. And the European Association of Nuclear Medicine is coming out with uh, a spec CT update. It's ready, it's going to be published next month. I think so, a whole uh, series on the applications of spec CT. And uh, the British were slightly better in this, and we did it uh, a year before than the ANM. So we have a series of spec CT in nuclear medicine communications. But if you're feeling rich, go for our book on radionuclide and hybrid imaging. And if you're more rich, go for an atlas of clinical nuclear medicine. And uh, both the books are quite useful, I think, sir. So. It's not because I was one of the authors, but you know, it is supposed to be useful. And one thing I've learned is uh, you always have to thank your teachers. You should not wait, because uh, I waited too long for uh, Professor Padi, because I always used to say thanks, but I nearly I never spoke to him in one-to-one -one basis to say thanks, because we always assume we all leave forever. But after his death, I've decided in every of my talk, I should say thanks to my teachers, not to be late, either I can go first or anybody can go first, but still I should thank the teachers. Whatever I said good is because of them. Whatever you didn't understand, it's my fault. So don't blame them for that. Coming to philosophical aspect, we all have science, fantastic. Uh, there is no winner or loser in life in a similar way. There is no a winning technology. There is, MR is not, it's like a, a, your iPad. Every time they launch, they say this is a revolutionary technology, and every six months there is a new version. So no technology is foolproof. Whether you use radiology, whether you use spec CT, whether you use nuclear medicine, there is always a gray area. But the way moving towards, away from the gray area is fusion imaging, and I think spec CT is spectacular. Thank you.